All right, so the next speaker is Sophie Etchard, um, founder and CEO of Read Better, Be Better. And it's an after school program. And again, if everyone can, can sit down and maybe quiet down a little bit. So the next speaker is Sophie Etchart, founder of Read Better, Be Better, um, an after school program that's looking to improve third grade reading rates in Arizona. Um, and she can illuminate the um, literacy crisis in more detail. Um, but in short, in my mind, the problem of mass incarceration is systemic. And the problem is, I think, in education. And as Benny poignantly reflected, he, he dropped out as a sixth grader. Um, and hearing that, my heart breaks many times. And as he got older, it became harder and harder to re-begin his education. Um, and painstakingly, he um, kind of got to the other side, the better for wear. And another key note is education not only in a utilitarian way, but also education in a kind of lifelong love of learning. Um, and I think learning is the lovely lace of what it means to be a human being. Um, and I think many are kind of starving for learning and don't quite know it. Um, and I think that's an undercurrent that has been kind of overflowing under the rose throughout, throughout the speakers, um, whether it's current students or, or current human beings that find themselves behind bars. Um, and without, without further overture, um, here's Sophie Etcher. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Christopher. Um, I just want to start by saying I'm so honored to be invited to, to talk here this afternoon. I'm listening to some of the panel here. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there the whole day, but listening to the panel here and the amazing work that's happening, it's very humbling to be able to come and speak with you guys. Um, Obviously, we're um, working with the population in the very, very beginning, very much from prevention, um, but I think we are working um, towards a very common goal. Um, and if you'll forgive me, I'm going to talk very much from the perspective of things that I kind of know about. This is a new um, world to me, and I, it was very fascinating researching for the presentation, but I will try and stick to the pieces that I kind of know about, and then... Um, I might get more confident to, to um, put some opinion in in the question and answers. Um, so, preventing the school to prison pipeline, you know, we have a very, very small part of a very big, um, big piece of work that is happening. Um, but I, th I think it's certainly uh, becoming more and more prevalent that, that young people are just going straight from school into prisons. And certainly when you start to do a very small amount of research, that seems to be a very prevalent topic. Um, and it goes into juvenile detention. The amount of schools that we work with that have SRO offices in them, um, you can certainly see that that makes the pipeline uh, shorter. And, and in some ways, for, uh, for authorities, it can be easier to, to solve a problem by taking a child straight from school and putting them straight to juvenile detention. Um, you guys will know these stats better than I, so um, forgive me if, if any of these numbers are wrong, but from what I saw, one in 10 high school dropouts um, are, are prisoners, and if you, if you graduate from high school, it comes to one, like, one in 35, which still seemed extremely high to me. Um, but 65% of prisoners do not have high school diplomas. So Christopher just talked to Ned, I'm sure you've been talking about that all day, but there, it is, there is no question that there is a direct correlation between the amount of education that a child receives, um, or I'm going to qualify that, the amount of education that we are able to provide to a child, um, and, and the chances of then ending up um, making bad choices. Um, so, talking to Arizona particularly, um, this stat is what our entire organization um, is founded upon. And I'll talk about what we do, but I'm just sort of pref prefacing it. 85% of Arizona's third graders from low income families are not reading at grade level. Um, that's a startling statistic, um, and it's what gets me up every single day. 
Um, and, and what that continues into is if you don't graduate high school, you are three, uh, four times less likely to graduate high school. If you don't graduate high school, then we move into the, the conversations that you guys have been having all day, you know far more about than I do. Um, but certainly, um, there was a stat, um, and I actually, I fact-checked it for this presentation. It turns out it's an internet myth um, that Chicago uses third grade literacy levels to predict how many jail cells they're gonna need in the future. Um, but the Atlantic did an article saying it's an internet myth, but perhaps we should look into actually whether we should start doing that. So there's enough, um, there's enough evidence there to make it a talking point, and certainly it, it became prevalent on the internet. I've been saying it for a while, so thanks you guys for making me fact check that. I won't be saying it anymore. Um, but we're talking about a third grade, so we're talking about an eighth grade, um, an eight-year-old child that if they don't read on grade level, um, they're four times le less likely to graduate high school. The research behind that from the Annie Casey Foundation is that the reason behind that is it's the last chance we teach a child to read and then they have to read to learn. Um, so if you, if you don't learn to read, you are, that's gonna close your choices down. You, you simply don't have the, the choices you're not able to engage in activities that you could choose to engage in that would help you make more good choices. You know, so you're, you're cutting a child off, basically. Um, and where Rebeta Bebeta comes from is, if we think about that, um, if we think about that statistic, um, certainly that third grade um, reading stat became a, a, a focal point for a lot of conversations at a statewide and a federal level. There is now an Arizona state literacy plan. It's the move on when reading legislation goes along with that plan. So if you if you don't read at grade level by the end of third grade, you will be retained in third grade. Um, and that is to try and prevent, you know, pushing kids forward without them having actually the skills to be successful. Um, so that's right, the, we were founded right about when the move on when reading law was coming into play. But what, what my perspective was is, if the research behind that law says um, that third grade is the last chance that we teach them to read and then they have to read to learn, um, then we need reading comprehension um, support, right? So it's not, it's not enough to be teaching these kids to read the words on the page. It's not enough to be teaching them um, fluency. We need to teach them to understand what they're reading. Um, First and foremost, from my point of view, because it's incredibly boring to read if you don't understand what you're reading. Um, you can't enjoy it. You can't choose to read things that, that are interesting to you. You're much less likely to choose to read at all um, because, because words on a page without comprehension have, there's, there's no light. You won't, you won't light a fire in a child's desire to learn. Um, so, that was my perspective of we're missing a huge piece of the work here if we pass them into fourth grade and they don't have comprehension skills. Um, and I actually engaged with a teacher. Um, I had come from working for Junior Achievement and we had 20,000 students coming through those programs a year and um, I was concerned about their ability to learn financial literacy if they didn't fundamentally, again, understand the words on the page. And I, I connected with their teacher and she said, well, we've got kids reading at six words per minute. We don't have the luxury of teaching reading comprehension. And so, well, now that is, that is no disrespect to that teacher who did have kids reading at six words per minute, who did have her, over 30 children in her classroom. Um, she's a phenomenal teacher, but there is only so much that you can do. And when reading comprehension becomes a luxury, then we have a problem. Um, so, you know, that, that's the problem in its essence from where we're coming from. Um, there are other problems that make it more complex. So Arizona um, is a particular, particular beast when it comes to valuing ed education um, in itself. So um, there is, again, a lot of talk right, right now about teacher pay. Um, people are protesting. If you look at the numbers um, between school vouchers, STOs, charter schools, we're taking money out of the public education fund. So we're taking money out of general education, out of the system that serves everyone. 
So public education is for everyone. You don't get to choose what students you choose to teach. You, you serve everyone. Um, if we're taking money out of that fund, and that's $3 billion since 2007 that have been taken out of the public fund, um, well, that, you know, that's how we end up here. That's how we talk about, that's how we end up talking about the school to prison pipeline, because we're simply not equipping the schools who serve all children to be successful. So Arizona spends 20,000 more on each incarcerated adult than they do on each K-12 student. So you can see where, I, I don't want to go as far as to say where priorities are, but, um, but there's, there's a disparity there, and what we can say is that the system is broken. Um, so, and what we've seen in recent years, um, national government spending on incarceration has risen three times faster than spending on, on education. So. 106 billion in education, over 300,000 in incarceration. So for me, it's, it's very skewed, and that's, that's why we have to have the conversation that you guys are having today. So what, what we do, um, we're the only nonprofit organization in Arizona that engages youth leaders to help solve the state's literacy crisis. So what we do is we inspire and we equip eighth graders. Um, we now have expanded it more to middle schoolers, so we inspire and equip sixth through eighth graders, and we, um, we train them, we facilitate, we encourage them, we motivate them to implement a reading comprehension curriculum with third grade students. So we're mobilizing the next generation of volunteers, the next generation of service learners, the next generation of hopefully teachers, um, and we're showing them what it feels like um, to make a difference in someone else's life. And in doing so, they are um, helping third graders be more successful. So trying to get the third graders into fourth grade better prepared to learn. So we're using literacy as a platform for future success. It's a tool, it's not our end goal. Um, we're a social justice organization, so we're looking much, much bigger than that, but literacy is, is our tool. Um, and we use eighth graders to make that happen. So our, our mission and vision, um, we help children improve literacy skills and become better learners. Um, our vision is a society in which children master the foundational skills necessary to become independent learners. We just want to give people choices. Um, it's none of my business to, to then take that any further than that. You know, every, everyone, choice means something different to everybody. Um, we just want people to have them. Um, and if, if we're saying that 85% of kiddos who have experienced poverty are not reading on grade level, they just don't have choices. They're not, uh, they're not able to be independent. We can't expect them to be independent if we don't give them that choice. Um, so our pillars for change are improving concentration, encouraging an active enjoyment of reading, and helping develop a deeper understanding of what is being read. So when I was working for um, Junior Achievement, we had an amazing, I don't know if anyone has ever been to J.A. Biztown, but it's, it's like a simulated city. It's awesome. They go in at fifth grade and they live there for a day and they go to the bank and they have a job and they cash their check and they go start shopping. It's, there's some nodding. It's an amazing program. Um, and they have these job descriptions. And uh, now it's a, it's a sort of unfair environment in some ways to, to really grasp if a kid can comprehend what they're reading. But um, I had come from running an organization in South America. I ran a nonprofit in Peru for two years before I moved here. And um, our kiddos over there had challenges, but what they were extraordinary at was um, sitting and listening. So, you know, there, there were other challenges. We had that passive piece and we really wanted them to kind of get more engaged, but they were really great at sitting and concentrating. When I came to the States and sat in Jay Biztown, these kids are just like, running wild through this simulation. I was like, okay, okay. We need to like be able to sit down for long enough to actually read a book. I think that's important too. Um, and I have pl plenty of ideas around technology and you know, I think um, I'm a massive fan of board games. So, but I, I, I think that's really important and I, I, I'm sort of joking, but at the same time, it's pretty serious. Like they really do need to be able to focus on one thing long enough to see if they can enjoy it. So we, we look very much at that. We do a lot of board games. We do a lot of concentration games, memory games, um, a lot of games around composure as well, around um, 
kind of the, the big kids have to try and make the little kids laugh and the little kids just have to keep a straight face and say, honey, I love you, I just can't smile right now. It's awesome. If you ever get the chance to do it, you should with a kid. Um, but so we're looking at concentration um, and then beyond that, encouraging an active enjoyment in reading. I touched on that earlier. If you don't enjoy it, you're not gonna keep doing it. We always have to look about a time when we no longer exist. So as an organization, our job is to put ourselves out of a job. Um, there are far too many nonprofits that exist because it's somebody's dream or somebody's passion. My passion is that the problem doesn't exist and we don't need to exist. So um, in order for that to happen, we need to look at self-efficacy. Um, and self-efficacy is, is much easier to achieve if, this, if the child just likes doing what they are doing. So we try and make it fun. We, we are an evidence program. My staff probably would say that I'm not a huge deal of fun. But, um, but when we go on site, we are fun. Like our kids should never know that they're receiving a literacy intervention. A teacher said to me the other day, she, she was kind of um, berating me, I guess. She's like, you guys are the worst. She's like, the kids think that they're going on a field trip every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon. I was like, score. Um, you know, she's like, I can't compete with that. You know, we can't, we can't make that happen in a classroom. And I said, that's why we're partner. You know, that's why we do what we do after school for 90 minutes twice a week. You have them every day for eight, you know, it's, it's a different scenario, it's a different context, but you have to do what you guys do, and we can only help in that 90 minutes. We're not, we're not replacing public education. We're trying to supplement and trying to help in a way um, that we know that we can. Um, so then helping develop a deeper understanding of what is being read, um, that's, that's where the comprehension piece come in, comes in. So our program's actually 90 minutes after school, twice a week. For the first 45 minutes, the kids do, um, uh, well, actually, here it is. The kids will do um, a reading an evidence reading comprehension curriculum. Eighth grader speaks to third grader. Um, it's based on constructivism, so they kind of go back and forth. There's a mentoring aspect to it, but basically the big, we call them bigs and littles, the big will model the reading comprehension strategy and give the, and give the little an opportunity to practice it. So they go back and forth through the book. Um, that's the first 45 minutes. The second 45 minutes of what I touched on earlier, it's board games, it's group games, it's group activities, but all evidenced activities looking at trying to improve um, concentration and give kids fun. Um, and then, you know, equals graduation, equals third grade reading improvement, eighth grade service learning, personal social responsibility, and we'll touch on what both groups get out of it in a, in a little while. Um, there's a little video here that hopefully you guys are gonna to have to be real quiet to see it in action. Joyce. There was a wonderful park nearby. Marvin loved to swing. Content. Content with his new life. So I'm gonna stop you there. I think Marvin has done things that no other ape has done. <laughs> Feeding time with the zookeeper wasn't looking. Marvin slipped out. The zookeeper couldn't find Marvin anyway. Can you stop there? This is my first sticky note. It says, why doesn't the zookeeper pay attention to the animals? Ah, oh, the jungle fruit, the fruit platter, said the waiter. An excellent choice. Can you stop there? Yes. I can see that Marvin dresses up all the time. So um, they're actually presenting at a governing board meeting there, which is why there's no other children in the room, otherwise that would have been a little spooky. Um, but, um, but you can see, so that they go through the book reading and when the little's reading the book stops and says, hey, that reminds me of time when I did this. So they, they're modeling, making connections with the text, they're modeling reading comprehension. Um, and then when the big reads it through, the little's gonna stop them and say, hey, this just popped into my head, or this reminds me. So they work in pairs. Um, yeah. Uh, so who we are targeting? Um, like I said, we're, the, we're a third grade program that's based on that research. I wish that we were a first, second, and third grade program. Um, we will be, but we're, you know, working on it, we're new. Um, but we're targeting third graders. 
We, we are targeting um, just based on need. So we look at kids who are not receiving interventions in school. So but like I touched on the, fe the federal reading, uh, the federal literacy plan. There are some interventions that go into schools that will give help to kids who are really struggling. So there's six words per minute kiddos. Um, we're actually looking at about 60 words per minute. So we're looking at kids who, according to the state literacy plan, are at risk of being retained. Um, but that they can read. So I'm very careful about the narrative there. I, um, I fundamentally support teachers and the work that they do. Um, you need a professional to teach a kid to read. Um, let's tell everybody in the house legislature that, please. Um, it is, it's an important job, it's a technical job. It's not one that you can just bring in an eighth grader in and say, you know what, we got this. Um, so that's really important. What we're doing is we're working on reading comprehension. So we are, we are um, complementing the structure of the public education system with an additional intervention after school. Um, so it's third graders who can read, but that's still are considered at risk of being kept behind. Um, that target market is 63,000 kids in, in Arizona. So there's work to be done. Um, there's, it's not looking like we're not gonna need to exist anytime soon. Um, and then the kind of neat bit here is our eighth graders are um, kind of not your average volunteers, I guess you could classify it as. The way I look at it is um, we're trying to target kiddos who need this. So if you are an honor society, if you're a sports player, you get teamwork, you've got leadership skills, you've probably got a group of friends. Um, what we're looking at is kids who need this sense of self, who need this sense of um, self-esteem and confidence. Um, I'm just gonna check this. It's, um, it can be anything. So the, the principals will choose these kids, but um, it can be anything from someone who's suffering from pretty severe social anxiety disorder. We had a kiddo who come into the program who um, really found it difficult to speak. She had a therapy dog, a St. Bernard, which seemed like an incredibly um, impractical therapy dog for Arizona, but far be it from me to make a judgment. Um, but so she, she came with this dog our program's 10 weeks long, um, and at the end of 10 weeks, she presented on her experiences at Read Better, Be Better at the Avondale Elementary School District Governing Board. So that was awesome. Um, so that's that's an example. You know, she kind of found her groove, right? She had, she found, if you, I use this very extraordinary example, but like, um, I founded a nonprofit, so I am never at home, and I have a 20-month-old baby, and definitely should be home more. And I have a husband who's very, very long-suffering, but definitely wishes I was home more. Um, when I get home, there's several people in the house who are kind of annoyed. There's also two pit bulls who are never annoyed. They are always pleased to see me. I think that's a kind of like what having a third grader is like. That's how I explain it to the eighth graders sometimes. Like you've got this person who it doesn't matter if your teachers are so mad at you all day, your parents or guardians you know, are, are losing their patience with you. You might be involved in some kind of justice system. You know, There's a lot of people who are kind of mad a lot of the time at you, um, this third grader thinks that you are the coolest thing that they've ever seen in their entire life. And they think that every Tuesday and every Thursday and every Tuesday and every Thursday for 10 weeks. You are their hero. Doesn't matter what your school day was like. When you get to the end of the day, we actually have them go and pick up their third graders from the classroom. When you get to that kid's classroom, their eyes are gonna light up. They're gonna be so thrilled to see you. That's not an experience that we give many eighth graders, and we especially don't give it to those eighth graders who I think need it. Um, you know, you might be an honor society kid who gets chosen to go and do the tutoring in kindergarten, but these guys don't get given that opportunity, and I can tell you, they will step up every time that you give them that opportunity. So we've got 
again, sort of social um, disorders, people who kind of haven't found their friend group, maybe they just recently moved here, their language might not be great, they only need to have a third grade reading level. So we're working with a lot of ESL eighth graders as well, um, who just kind of haven't found their groove, all the way to um, eighth graders who school resource officers are, are targeting because of behaviors that they are displaying after school. and. Um, you know, eighth graders, it starts to get a little bit more serious, some of that after school activity. So we are kind of keeping them off the streets and helping them try and make good choices. So um, we're trying to give this opportunity, again, to eighth graders who need it um, and who probably wouldn't otherwise get it. And it's amazing when we talk to eighth grade teachers um, because I, as the chief exec, will sometimes be told if there are particular security concerns, but most of the time we don't really know much about these eighth graders' school days. And then we'll suddenly find out, like, this kid, you know, has been suspended seven times during this year. I was like, really? The guy's like a freaking angel in the program. And they're, they're always so annoyed with us because they're like, well, it's so easy for you. But, I mean, for twice a week, for 90 minutes, it is easy because you've given them responsibility and they stand up to it. You know, they, they enjoy that responsibility and we, we structure it so, it's so highly structured that we're really kind of setting them up for success in that they just, they show up, we make them feel like a hero and every single minute after that for the next 90 minutes is taken care of. They don't have to um, really put themselves out there too much. Um, and so I think we really set them up for success, but it's just been so extraordinary to see these guys that a lot of people have already written off. Um, volunteering, we have kids who've, who've put in about 100 service hours already, and they're like 13 years old, you know, and, and they're going to high school. Um, some of these kids were not projected to even go to high school, but these kids are going to high school with a certificate that says, I've already done 100 hours community service, so I'm good on that, you know, I just need to learn right now. And that, I, I'm really, really proud of that. And I think it's really important to just set them up for success. Um, put them ahead of the game, you know? Um, and I think, I think that they will then, again, you're talking about um, self-efficacy, they will then continue to live up to that. Um, the schools that we work with, um, I can talk for a long time about public education. Um, uh, so see me afterwards if you'd like to know more, but um, I'm pretty angry about it. We only work with public education school districts. Um, a lot of that is, is a practical issue. We can roll out a whole school district in one go, um, and so it makes us more efficient, leaner, able to serve more kids. Um, but I also fundamentally believe in public education as the cornerstone of social justice. I think um, in order to rebuild community, you've got to send your kid to the community school. If your community school is failing, then you fix it. Um, you get on the school board, you go, you ask questions, you support, you go and read with kids there. Um, you, we should rally around as a community. I feel like that um, has kind of got forgotten in the school choice. Um, I, I fundamentally respect every parent's choice to want the best for their kid. Um, but like someone just said here, we're all growing up together. Someone's gonna be your neighbor. Someone's gonna, you know, we're, we are in this together. And I just think public education, public education is such a simple example of that in our community and so, I believe that I, I try and um, inspire my staff to, to believe that. My staff are predominantly student teachers, so we, we talk a lot about social justice and under-resourced districts. We serve, we look at third grade literacy levels and we look at socioeconomic data. That's how we, we decide where we need to go. So um, it doesn't take long to figure out that that's not necessarily um, the districts that have the money to pay for it. Um, so we are a non-profit organization, and other than great things like this that I get to do, I'm a full-time fundraiser. That's what I do, is try and raise the money so that we don't need to charge schools so that we can go where it's needed. Um, the, 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 that stat about the 85% of kids, of kids who have experienced poverty not reading on grade level and um, we found out about a year ago that you can actually switch that round and, to, and switch it into a positive. So um, 
if you can, with interventions, with, you know, with the right kind of support and the right kind of system in place, if you can get a kid to read on grade level by the end of third grade, there's an 89% chance that they will graduate high school, irrespective of socioeconomic background. So what that means is you're essentially removing the negative effects of poverty on a child's chances of being successful. That makes my whole body and hair stand on end. That, that is a real chance to make change. Um, very, very young. Um, and so I, you know, I feel the weight of that and I think um, we have to serve the children who need it as a priority. Um, and the students who are most at risk, according to, again, all of the stuff that you guys know and are working with, you know, in, in the prisons, the reasons why those kids get there. A third grader is a third grader is a third grader. Eight, gra you know, eight-year-old children, your zip code should not matter. You're just a child, but what's happening is we're sending a certain group, constantly setting them up for failure. And so um, I believe strongly that we have to start in the communities that we are systemically neglecting. Um, start there and then, you know, spread from that. Um, so uh, some of what we have been able to do, um, like I said, you know, we are focused on third grade reading. That is our first and foremost, our mission, helping children um, improve literacy skills and be, become successful, uh, be independent learners. Um, so we were founded in uh, 2014. We piloted it in 2015 um, and took, took some pilot data from that. That pilot data was so compelling that we grew from one to two to five to 10 to now 21 schools in just over two years. Um, and this is the data that's really driven that. That's why it's a privilege to lead this organization. I don't really have to drive it so much as we look at this and we all go, okay, we've got to do more. Because our kids are showing a 37% improvement as compared to the control group. So a student who has been in Read Better, Be Better for 10 weeks, um, on average, will improve 37% more on standardized reading comprehension tests than a child who didn't receive the program. So that, that is enough evidence to know that, that, you know, that is an extraordinary impact that we've been able to have on those third graders future without even talking about the byproduct of the fact that our eighth graders' um, language arts scores are, going, scores are going up, their personal social responsibility scores are going up. They, um, we have one in four eighth graders saying that they will commit to volunteering in the future even though they'd never volunteered before. Um, one in seven of our reading leaders, or bigs, is saying that they memorize comprehension strategies and go home and implementing it with their siblings in the home. How awesome is that? We're talking about kids who people have already said, nah, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're a pain, they're with the school resource officer the whole time. They've already, and I, you know, I don't want to, um, I don't want to speak ill of people who are making those decisions. They're making those decisions because they're so chronically under-resourced. They literally only have so much time to deal with so many things. So they don't mean to write those kids off. I don't think it's through ill will. It's just a practicality of like, I have to focus my efforts somewhere. I can't really focus it on these guys because they're taking a lot of my time. Well, we're taking those guys and they are saying, not only am I gonna show up for you three hours a week, I'm gonna memorize it and take it home and implementing it with my siblings, cousins, you know, whoever's in my home, which a lot of the time they're busy houses. So you're looking at your, not only are you looking at, I'm thinking, well, how many more kids does that mean that we're reaching? Like you're exponentially um, expanding your impact, but I'm also, you know, on a human level, you're taking a 13 year old and, and they are organically, we don't ask them to do that. I didn't even dream, like, I'm thinking about my self-involved, dramatic eighth grade self. I was certainly not, you know, going above and beyond. I wasn't being the, given the opportunity to, um, but we're giving them the opportunity to, and they're showing up and doing more than we could ever have dreamed of asking them to do. So 
the outcomes are are extraordinary and they're humbling um, and they are constant. So, so that is what drives us to keep keep doing what we're doing. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this. I'll read them out if you'll forgive me. But um, some of the quotes of what people are saying. Our seventh grade reading leaders are keeping out of trouble and making better choices. Um, that's a principle from Avondale. Uh, she's, she said that even like in the break between when they, when they break it before Christmas and then they come back after Christmas, she's like, when are you starting? <laughs> like, you need to start. They're already like, they need this, you know? Um, so we've got to work on making the, uh, I guess, making the effects last longer. Um, I love the kids I was working with and knowing that I was helping them, it helped me to be more responsible. That's an eighth grader. Um, they think about their legacy. So when we were first, when we were first accepted as a pilot in Phoenix Al, um, at a school that's like 16th Street in McDowell, um, the principal said, you know, you're not meant to say this, she's not meant to say this. She's like, I, I don't know that we can get these kids to high school, you know, like I can't, they can't visualize it. They can't see what they would look like in high school. They just can't sort of make that image become clear. So why don't we think about their legacy? Let's have them think about their effect on others. Um, because at that age, that's really important to you, you know, to how you're seen by others and um, that sense of kind of power. I think you feel powerless. Um, all, all, I, that's what I notice amongst a lot of our bigs. You know, they feel like they don't have a voice. Like, they feel like they're powerless, they're angry. Um, well, we're saying, Think about the effect that has on this little third grader who worships you. Um, it, it just changes the dynamic, it changes the narrative, it changes the way they think about themselves and it changes the way they think about their community. Um, Read Better Be Better allows eighth graders a chance to be mentors and leaders, feel pride and really gain a sense of self-esteem, helping younger children and seeing the results as a social worker. Um, so it's, it's a sense of, um, community that I think is is really important. You've got, um, in the schools that we are working with, there are also schools that I said targeting. Um, so you've got kids who show up one day and then don't show up the other day. Um, and so you've got someone who's looking out for you, who knows, you know, who's, who's looking out for you at break time, making sure you do show up to school every day. And if you don't, you know, what happened? Why weren't you there? And creating those networks and creating that sense of community where, um, like I happen to live right by where our pilot, it's not a total accident, right by where our pilot school is. Um, and so I go to the local park there and you can hear the kiddos saying like, that's my big, that's my little, hey, like they're reaching out and they're creating networks outside of just in our classrooms. Um, and again, that's a sense of community that creates shared accountability um, and it creates, uh, that third grader is visualizing, you know, we're allowing kids to visualize something outside of just where they're at, their current reality. And um, so I think that, again, helps, it's a holistic community change as opposed to just this very targeted intervention. Um, I'm gonna, s it looks like that, didn't no. There's another video, it was really cute, but you can go on to our YouTube video and watch it. Um, so I touched on this, um, I did found the organization um, 2015, uh, did one pilot site, 32 kids, um, this semester, that was January 2015, um, this semester we were projected to serve 1,480 students, um, so that's two years that we've grown from 32 to 1,480. So that's why I'm never home and I struggle to breathe. Um, but it, it is extraordinary. And then looking forward um, for the 2021 school year, we're projecting to serve 6,800 kids per year. Um, if you remember, the target market is 63,000 is how many kids that, that are considered at risk just in the state of Arizona. Um, so it's only scraping the surface, but um, but it is kind of as fast as we can go right now. 
Um, I touched on, you know, we're a non-profit organization, so it is not me that does this work by myself. We do it with the support of an extraordinary community that believe in this work and believe in the data that we're getting. And um, for you guys, what I thought, um, there are so many ways to get involved in the work that we do. We have four full-time members of staff. We run this organization extremely lean. Um, there are so many ways to get involved. We've had amazing people out of the College of Social Transformation. Um, we're always looking for interns, and our interns do not make copies. Our interns bring in money. They write presentations. They, if you have a staff of four and you're serving 1,400 kids per semester, there's some pretty meaningful work to do way beyond making copies. So if you're interested in, in meaningful experience, um, come and check it out. We're also lo always, always looking for paid people to come and run the sites. I said typically those people are student teachers, um, but there is, we train everybody um, and we get them super jazzed about public education and you may even transfer to an education major, you never know. Um, but we provide um, a full workforce development opportunity. So. Um, there, are, there are tons of ways to get involved. Come and reach out afterwards. Um, but I really would love for you guys to have some questions because I said I, I wasn't wholly sure. I wanted to target what I was talking about to be relevant to you. But if there's some other pieces that would be interesting, I would love for, to open that up if that's cool. I'm looking at the boss over there. So I'll put that up there. And then um, does anyone have any questions that, that I can help with? Yeah. So, what do you think about the move on when reading legislation? Do you, I don't necessarily want to know if you support it or not, but do you feel like it was a, do you think it's being implemented well? Do you think, you know, is it a good idea? I'm just curious what your opinion about that legislation is. Um, well, right now there are so many clauses um, that mean that you can not apply the law. I mean, I'm not, I don't really see it being implemented all that much. I mean, they gave it two years of a buy, I think, didn't they? They had to wait two years because we don't have any teachers. So if, you, if we've got, if we're saying, if the most recent NAEP data says 70% of Arizona's third graders are not reading at grade level, then 85 if you retain them all in third grade, we don't have any third grade teachers. So, I mean, I'm a pragmatist. You just can't do it anyway. So, which is why um, there's, you know, infinite provisions of, did you spell your name this way on this test on Thursday? Okay, never mind. We'll pass you up anyway. Um, so, I don't, I'm not sure I see it being implemented. I know that it, I know that kids have been left behind. We've had a kid um, kept behind. We had a kid, not one of our kids, um, but we heard in a school that we're in that they didn't, because they're allowed to the summer, right? So they get summer school to, again, another reason to try and help them move forward. They give them summer school. Well, this kid went to summer school and I guess didn't improve enough, but they didn't tell his family and they didn't tell him. So on the first day of school, he walked into fourth grade and they pulled him out and put him back in third grade in front of the whole school. You know, like in front of all the third graders and all the fourth graders. So um, it, it is being implemented with some kids, but they're, they're so overstretched. You know, I, I think they're looking for every which way, probably with all the right reasons, um, but... I don't see it being implemented because there's, I mean, I've, I've sat on the, um, the committee at the ADE and they, the, the list is like this long um, in the legislation of how you can get out of it, so. Any other questions that might get me into less trouble? Yeah, did you have a question? Oh, you're just stretching. <laughs> okay, well if, oh, oh. Hi. You have to really shout from back there. I know there's a lot of programs that are targeting those children who are approaching who could possibly get to that level for third grade. What about, do you know if um, there are any programs for those that could set up kids who is falling far below and might not make that goal? Because what I see as an educator is those kids just get left behind and we only focus on the kids who might make it. And with the new implementation of this, um, there's a large group of kids are so far behind that no one has the time or energy to focus on them. Well, I mean, you will know more than me as an educator. What, 
my experience is that, um, or according, again, this is, there is a difference between in theory and what's actually happening in practice. In theory, according to the Arizona State Literacy Plan, if you are falling for, far below, then you should have tiered intervention. So that should be provided, and money for that should be provided at a federal and state level. So um, from my research, um, what, what I had said was, well, that, and again, I'll, I'm gonna say the same thing again, that is targeted, specific, technical work that a professional has to do. So I think it becomes, yes, I think there is, there's room for just supporting with those kids and reading with them as much as possible. Um, but that is supposed to be being done and being paid for by the state. Um, and to allow specific teachers to do that. And tier, that tiered intervention has to be implemented by a qualified teacher for all the reasons that we just talked about. So we can't actually do that work. Now, are we sometimes used as that work? Sure. Uh, and I kind of turn a blind eye to it um, because at the end of the day, I, I think there is an argument of every little helps. Um, so I'm certainly not gonna turn a kid away um, and I, if I find out, you know, unofficially that we're being used as tiered intervention, then I will say, you know, we are not evidenced to do that, but we will do our best. Um, so that's my only answer. It doesn't really help you, um, but I just think it's really dangerous if you start coming in, you know, and saying, well, we're going to help with these, you know, if kids are reading at six words per minute, they need real, really technical help that a professional needs to provide. Um, and we should have more teachers and more literacy experts. And, um, you know, let's just put more money into the public education system rather than taking it out. But there's, yeah, I mean, I agree with you, and, but there's nothing, that, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I don't know if that helps, sorry. Yeah. Um, your your staff teacher for the 2017 were really impressive. Um, I'm wondering if you are resourced do a longitudinal study so that you could track those 2017 kids, you know, over the course of the next four or five years, see if their um, grade level, you know, if their scores maintain superiority over control. Yeah. That's a great question. Might be the right crowd to say, well, looking for an intern to do that. Um, uh, it's on our, it's on our five-year strategic plan. Um, I'm talking, we have an amazing professor in Marilyn Fulton who's been, who's been so supportive and, and we are trying to spread word that we need help on that. We, our independent evaluation is paid for by United Way every three years, um, but we get $5,000, so we tend, that tends to be each, you know, they do the last three years. Um, and we're only three years old, so we got one of that first that first semester of data, then we're doing it again this summer and they'll be able to do these three years. Um, but I, my feeling is even if we just did a really small focus group, we have such amazing relationships with our schools, um, just to kind of track five kids we've been running for three years, so we know that we've got third graders from Phoenix L who are now in sixth grade. Um, but the short answer is no, we do not have the resource. It's not, it's not in the budget. Um, but it is on our strategic plan and is on our intern to-do list. But we only have two interns and they're currently, you know, doing a lot of... Because for fundraising support over time, probably a focus group is going to cut it. Excuse me? I said for, to support your fundraising effort over time, probably focus group anecdotal. Well, I mean, yeah. I was told by Helios that we are very, very close to becoming evidence-based because, because of the amount of data that we get. So we take teacher evals, we do quantitative self-assessments, uh, quantitative self-efficacy, we do um, qualitative student surveys, and we also take all standardized testing. So we have kind of like a, a wealth of data, um, and we had volunteers, that's all centralized, so it all goes into an access database and it all gets spread out. So that we actually don't have to put a lot of resource into being able to do that regularly. Um, so we're really close, we're in a good position, we have a really strong foundation, but we need a randomized control test to be able to get evidence-based, and that, this is not my world, but 
all I know is that sounds real complicated and even really smart people say it takes some time and some resource to do that. Um, but, but from what I understand, and I certainly know from you know, being with my people, we are incredibly privileged with the data that we have. Um, so, so it looks like I should maybe stop. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on.